Ladies and gentlemen, a very special guest. She's been on the show before, Jennifer Marohasi. Now, for those of you who don't know about her, she has a bachelor's as well as a PhD from the University of Queensland. She has worked uh, extensively in academia, including with the Indonesian Bureau of Meteorology. She, she now is with the Institute of Public Affairs as a senior fellow. I hope that's correct. But her passion is documentary films. And since 2019, she's been releasing films about the Great Barrier Reef. Some of the titles are Beige Reef, Clowns on the Ribbon's Edge in 2020, and Finding Parites, which I think is your best film because it just has some of the most impressive corals. And it was released at a time when they were saying us that the Great Barrier Reef was dying. And now we have a new report. So at All Out tonight, welcome to the show, Jennifer. It's great to be with you. Now, we're going to talk about the annual summary report of the coral reef condition. But before we do that, guys, you can all go check out uh, Jennifer Morahassi and the work she does over at her website. And it is the website is jennifermorahassi.com. Am I correct? That's correct. And Morahassi is M A R O H A S Y. Yeah. And we'll have a link below if you don't know how to spell, which is okay. Now, on your website, uh, do you have access? Uh, can you access all of the documentary films? Uh, you can access two of them easily, um, uh, Beige Reef and Finding Parietes. I, I do think that you can access Finding Parietes from my homepage. And um, I've actually got a new film out, um, but it's, uh, it's not available on the internet yet. And we will talk about that in just a moment. Um, but more importantly, I want to get to the fact that you and I talked right before we started recording that I did a, um, a short podcast a few days ago over on my other channel. I think I'm not so sure what channel I put it on, but Ma Malcolm Roberts uh, was screaming at, uh, I guess, in what do you call it there? Parliament or what is it called? The Australian Parliament, yes. So the lower house of the Australian Parliament has just um, passed legislation, uh, our net zero legislation. It's going to be devastating to industries uh, here in Australia. Was he talking about that legislation or was he talking about something else? I'm pretty sure he was because he was saying uh, the reason that they're doing all this is because of um, all the talk about climate change and destroying the reefs and we need to do something and it has to be done now. Uh, but then this report is coming out at the same time. And so he was shoving it in their face. He said, look, the reef is the best it's been in 36 years. And yet we're, we're going to continue to decimate the economy for what, based on what a fairy tale. And, and then I read your blog on your website and it's a little deeper than we could ever imagine, isn't it? It is. And I guess, yes, if people would like to go to that most recent um, uh, blog post, which talks about how the, um, the methodology underpinning the current report is so uh, very unscientific. Um, so actually, yeah, latest surveys of coral cover fundamentally unscientific. So... I think that that's a really important blog post because it goes through the problems with um, the methodology used to arrive at the latest conclusions. But before we maybe get into that detail, if we just come back to, to what Malcolm was talking about, which is the new legislation. Now, for... It's been two years of really aggressive lobbying by a lot of Great Barrier Reef uh, science managers to support this net zero legislation. I think it's right around the Western world. They're trying to impose net zero legislation uh, on us. It's the same in the States, isn't it? This obsession with net zero. Well, I mean, what I've been talking about is that what we have is evidence of what happened with similar type legislation in Sri Lanka, the entire country collapsed. And now they imposed it in the Netherlands and the farmers have re revolted and the same type of legislation happened in Canada and now Canada and so on and so forth. And now we've got Australia. 
So on the 4th of August, this is going to be a really significant date, the 4th of August, they introduced, it passed through the lower house of the Australian Parliament. That's where they were potentially going to have problems. So they've as, as good as got that legislation. This net zero legislation is going to impose really significant restrictions, for example, on agriculture, and we've got major agricultural industries in catchments all along the Great Barrier Reef, those industries are going to have to uh, contract. Uh, I mean, I know that some of these activists since the 2001 WWF Save the Reef campaign, they've been wanting to restrict fertiliser use in Great Barrier Reef catchments, and they're going to achieve this through the rollout of this new legislation. Now, they at the same time that in that it legislation got through the lower house of the Australian Parliament, the exact same day, the Australian Institute of Marine Science threw out this report saying that they had record coral cover uh, across two thirds of the Great Barrier Reef. Now, a lot of people on our side, if you see there's two sides, were were just jumping up and down excited about this two thirds. Um, uh, increase in, in coral cover. And I think that was almost why they threw this report out then as a distraction from this really significant legislation that people just weren't making comment about, some key people weren't making comment about because they were distracted by this, um, this new piece of, this new report from Ames. I also think they were throwing it out as a bit of a lifeline to the tourism industry because you know what? The legislation that went through is designed to close mining and agriculture and perhaps now they're going to start talking about the Great Barrier Reef being in good shape to try and resurrect the tourism industry that they've been killing over the last two years. So three why, would tourists, why would tourists come to Australia if there's... Uh, extremely high priced food because agriculture is collapsing because there's no fertilizer. And I mean, and then, and there's energy. So there's rolling blackouts in the summer because there's no energy production. It sounds like a stupid plan and that you have very dumb witted or dim witted policymakers. So the, the, Pressure has been so intense during this last federal election. So we've had these federal elections every three years and to a large extent they've kept the climate change issue uh, at bay and they've kept the climate change legislation out of the parliament. This last election, you've no idea the extent to which some of these key scientists at the Australian Institute of Marine Science, at the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority, at James Cook University were really playing up the fact that the Great Barrier Reef was dead and dying because of climate change. Now, the great irony is that we actually have had an increase in the amount of coral around the perimeters of the reefs, which is all they're measuring with these uh, underwater surveys. And it's because we've had a, a, a significant decline in both the number and intensity of cyclones, really since they were started recording good cyclone data going back to the 1970s. So we've got this, this the reality is we've got a decrease significant decrease in the number and intensity of cyclones and an increase in coral cover around the perimeters of these reefs, which goes against, of course, the catastrophic anthropogenic global warming narrative. So there's been no reporting on that increase in coral cover or decrease in cyclones until they got that key legislation through. And then all of a sudden they're releasing one of these reports that, that's completely irreconcilable with this other report that they were releasing in March. And by the way, this new report is all about data that they were collecting in March 
for this other report that was basically saying we had 90% um, severe bleaching. Now, that's totally irreconcilable with the idea that we've got healthy corals that are expanding their range, which is what this new report's saying. But nobody's holding them to account. And I just, I, I, I just find it really upsetting that, that they aren't being held to account. Yeah, uh, you, your audio was breaking up there for the last minute. Um, so if you could be that passionate again and repeat the last statement, that would be helpful. So I'm not sure what you didn't get, but I guess there's this incredible irony that we've had actually a decrease in the number and intensity of cyclones while we've had an increase in coral cover, but none of that's been reported. None of that has been reported because there has been this obsession with telling everybody that coral cover is decreasing, that the corals are dying, and that the cyclones are increasing in intensity, completely ignoring um, the data, never mind the flaws in the data, but completely ignoring this data at all because they've been so desperate to get this net zero legislation through. Now, I've been saying we really need to hold these institutions to account in terms of the detail of how they're undertaking these surveys, but there just hasn't been that interest in the detail. And there's been all this, you know, we need red team, blue teams, we need to reform. No, we need to defund. We need to defund the Australian Institute of Marine Science. We need to defund so many of these institutions and so many of our universities which are corrupt to the core. They do not care at all about the quality of the science. They don't care about what they're teaching anybody. They're just obsessed with this idea of implementing legislation that's going to close down industries, that's going to keep us indoors and going to keep us away from the very thing that always saves me, which is getting out into nature and seeing how beautiful it is. You know, the beauty of a sunset, the beauty of a sunrise, the the, the still beauty of the Great Barrier Reef. I've been diving the Great Barrier Reef for 50 years. Individual reefs go through cycles, often with a cyclone in particular. They'll devastate an individual reef, but then that reef will come back and often quite quickly. Overall, there has been no change. It's very, it's very difficult to... to to see any change overall at the Great Barrier Reef over the 50 years that I've been uh, been diving it. Yeah, and there, there's good reason for that. As an invertebrate paleontologist and a field geologist, I've uh, been in the field and have looked at um, probably over 100 different reef complexes uh, through the Paleozoic. And these are... Um, there's lots of climate change happening because as a stratigrapher, I'm looking at millions of years when I'm in a quarry face. And these reefs are resilient. Sea level rises and falls and, you know, marine environments change and the, re the reef moves and it recovers. And so 50 years is not even a geologic instant. It's, it's basically not even a time frame where a geologist would be able to have an assessment. It is a literally a blip of an instant. And the fact that they're, these scientists are so short-sighted, they can't be this inept. I mean, you and I, we don't know each other, but we've become good friends from across the globe because we're reasonable and we have critical thinking skills. And when we discuss facts, like we haven't discussed them with each other, but what I know is what you know. And, and I went in and I looked for the information. And, and I think that what we can conclude from this is that just like in America, um, in the US, NASA and NOAA have been saying that hurricanes have been increasing in intensity and frequency. And that is completely antithetical to the data. It's very easy. We have one of the most famous meteorologists in the United States, uh, Ryan Maui. 
and he's very respected. He's put out these graphs over the last five years showing frequency and intensity of Atlantic hurricanes is decreasing. And the same thing's happening in Australia and the institutions that use your tax money to create policy that is going to bankrupt you is now using the same propaganda mechanism to flip the switch and, and, and to bring tourists back because why would you want to spend thousands of dollars if you're from the United States to come to the Great Barrier Reef if it's dead? I don't want to go there. It's not a thing. For 10 years, they've been feeding me this thing that it's broken, bleached, and ugly and disgusting. When in fact, you've been diving on it and it's the most glorious place on earth. And those are the facts. Those, those are the facts. And... Uh... And it's sad that it has been so misrepresented over the last few years. And it's really sad that nobody was holding to them to account, for example, with the survey results that were put out in March saying that more than 90% of the Great Barrier Reef was severely bleached. And I went to John Brewer Reef, which was meant to be the epicenter of that bleaching. It was meant to be the worst bleached of the worst bleached of all the reefs. And it was just beautiful, a coral wonderland. In actual fact, it was more colorful than usual because some of the corals had kicked out some of their zoos and phthalate and were um, fluorescing. They, they were producing this um, colorful protein. Um, but they were saying on the aerial surveys that this reef was bleaching white when it was actually bleaching a little bit and it was bleaching colourful. Now, if you fly at 150 metres above a reef uh, in an aeroplane, I know you can pretty much see nothing. You can photograph even a reef that's bleaching colourful and it will come out depending on the, the angle of the sun that day as looking um, very white and very bleached just because you're so high up um you, you can't basically see anything they did this flyover survey of the great barrier reef concluding that it was all severely bleached and bleaching white and it was so easy just to disprove that and um i i was i've got one of my recent if you pull up my blog post i can show you my my more recent one that actually shows we want to just pull up those those blogs and you can actually see um, or just um, you just list them. You, know, you can't see anything from the altitudes at which they were flying. Just go to the experts with money ignorant of corals. It doesn't show you at all the different altitudes, but I'm pretty sure you'll be able to see uh, the that blog right. experts. On the right, on the right, you'll see right experts. Part four. Yeah, John that Moore. one. Got just it. go down a little bit. And I'll show you what this reef looks like from 150 metres, I think. So. so that's under the water. And let's just go down a bit more. 120 metres above? Yeah, that's, 100 and, that's 120 metres, which is your legal drone limit. So you can't tell anything about Well, no, I can blow this up too even. Let's, let's share it uh, blown up for the, for the people so that they can really get a, what you're trying to say here. Um, I have that. I just increased the size quite significantly. And here we are. This is the reef blown up. Yeah. So they're flying 30 meters higher than that again. And then this was their survey in March, their aerial survey that concluded that the reefs were, were all bleached. And I was saying which reefs, and they were, for example, saying, uh, not to me because they won't talk to me, but saying to others, John Brewer, for example, okay? And then you go to John Brewer Reef and you see just that photo above in that same blog post is what exactly these corals look like under the water on the reef crest. So if we go to that same... This was just one of my snaps. That's exactly that same same patch of, of reef. Now, that coral straight in front of us is actually a healthy beige coral. That it's horribly bleached. Look at it. It's dead. 
the coral to the left that's going pink is actually bleaching, but it's bleaching colorful. Now, not a lot of people understand that concept of bleaching colorful, but that's actually what you had at uh, parts of the Great Barrier Reef in March. But they weren't even saying it's bleaching colorful, which is something that happens every so often. Uh, and then the reef recovers. I've been back to John Brewer um, Reef and, uh, and it's lost its pink and it's mostly now browns and greens, which is the color of the zooxanthellae, the symbiotic algae. But yeah, you and you can see there right in the middle that we have a nice, pretty small a coral that's brown and a small coral that's green and, and some branching coral that's obviously clearly fine, correct? That's right. So this photo was taken at the time their overhead photos were saying it's bleached. Now, they wouldn't meet with me, but they met with others who said, what's the story about like the bleaching you know are you ground truthing this are you you actually checking and they're saying oh we haven't had a chance to get out yet and check you know they really didn't care because this was all timed that march flyover was timed to correspond with the fly in of these united nations experts that were going to downgrade the barrier reef at the same time our prime minister part of the coalition that had been resisting the climate change legislation was trying to hold all of this at bay with the upcoming federal election. And he was just gazumped by these people. And then the 4th of August, mm -hmm. they say, and they've actually said, oh, the recovery has been faster than we thought at the reef. We do, they, they've got no photographs of their flyovers. They've got no photographs of their ground truthing to show that the flyovers actually show bleaching. So I will show them a flyover that shows how you can get the concept that it's all white or, or beige or washed out, but it's actually colourful under the water. And I say show us your photographs that show where it's all bleached and they won't provide any of that. Now they're saying there's been uh, good recovery, very fast recovery. Um, and so just, no just if you're not following us out here, they're using propaganda at the right moment and the right time. And what Jen has been saying is that at in March, the same time they were doing the fake flyovers, they're real flyovers, but they're giving you fake information like, oh, we have no idea to check the reef. It's bleached, but we were not going to check it. But Jen is sitting there with the data to say, no, it's it's colorful bleaching. It's alive and well, and, it, and, and, it's, and you're giving bad information, but they don't want to hear that until legislation is passed, which will cripple the country. And, and then shortly after that, they're like, oh, yeah, she's right. It's the, the coral reef is great. <laughs> Good summary. If you if I can just show you, if we go back to my um, my website, just the extent of the craziness. Yeah. And if you can just show me which blogs from the home page, I can just see them down the right hand side. I want to find one that's titled Back to Beige, John Brewer Back to Beige. We can just bring that up. If we go down, it might be off the front page. Let's see. Uh, you want it? It's a blog? Yeah, no, just go, just go up a little bit and I can see um, whether it's off. So the nun said blind. So we just go up a bit higher and you can see this is so people can learn about my website as well. If you just go up a bit higher, you'll get to the search button. And if you just put it, type in back to beige, Back to be beige, and then John Brewer. Oh, I just I just hit enter. Okay. That should work anyway. Let's just go down. So John Brewer Reef, back to beige. Just click on that for me if you don't mind. That's the July eleventh, twenty twenty two blog. Yeah, that was the day after I went back to John Brewer. Now this picture at the top on the left, we've got what was in the Guardian newspaper back in March, okay? So that was the Guardian, the left-hand side, and they showed that coral, and this is John Brewer Reef, and they're going, it's not supposed to be white. One of the Great Barrier Reef's healthy reefs succumbs to bleaching. That was the photo uh, from March, 
And I actually went back uh, to that reef early in April and this um, coral, because I found that coral then to film it for my new film and it actually did look like that. I then went back to that reef in July and it, that's what it looks like on the right. Now, if you just scroll down a little bit, you'll just see it in a bit more detail. So this is my daughter on the right there. That's, this is an underwater photograph of her. So she's got a snorkel in her mouth. She's under the water. But the water's so crystal clear, you can get that clarity. And she's That's got the little reef health uh, chart there, and it's, it's yeah. showing pretty, pretty healthy. It's showing beige. So most corals around the world are beige in color. That's the common color of the coral uh, zooxanthellae. And this is exactly the same coral. And it went, it did get a little bit bleached um, it, and it lost its color. It didn't bleach color for this one. It, it lost some of the zooxanthellae. That was happening in March, early April. In that article in The Guardian, and they talked about the flyovers and the reefs going white and 90% severely bleached, they said it was going to take 12 years for these corals to recover. And, and so if you're looking in four months, there was 90% recovery on this single branching coral. It's a hundred percent recovery because the tips of yeah, that, the white tips are fresh. They're new growth. Yeah. The new growth does not have zooxanthellae. Yeah. This is a totally healthy coral. Now that blog post, okay. It wasn't picked up by anybody from our side, which sort of annoyed me a little bit because I sent it around to different people and I said, you know, like, you know, it actually takes a lot of effort. Just this John Brewer Reef, it, it is, it's three hours offshore. You know, you've you got to make sure that everything's working for you in terms of the weather and your camera batteries and, you know, somebody to come with you. In this case, my daughter came with me. Yeah, but so you were able to find the same exact coral. That's insane. It takes a little bit of effort because this is a pretty big reef, right? Okay. So I'm a bit obsessive when it comes to these things. So I, I found the same coral. I've, I, I, you know, and first up, you've got to believe that you can do it. And I, and that finding Parides movie, you know, the one that people can watch from the, from my homepage. Yeah. That's about people saying to me, Jen, what are you doing going out looking for these parodies? You'll never find the same parodies. And I said, well, let's have a go. Let's go try. Okay. So I went to John Brewer Reef. I'd looked at the articles in the Guardian and in other places. And it was in the back of my mind that if I can find the same coral, that would be pretty cool. Right. And I did. Right. And it's in my movie, which I've got problems in terms of I'd love somebody to give me a wad of money so that I can arrange distribution and, and marketing because at the moment I've got the movie made, but I haven't got right. any funds for distribution and so marketing. So those out there that have a wad of money, get in contact with me and let's make this happen. Thank you. Because I just don't want to put this movie onto YouTube. I just don't want to give it to YouTube. Yeah, she's been giving uh, these amazing documentaries to YouTube. And, and then you started putting them, I think, on Vimeo. So they're kind of protected. And But this time, let's get it produced right. And we can, and then it can, yeah. And, and then it will be something. It won't be censored. It won't be held at bay. People will watch it. Thank you. So <laughs> that was just a little side. So this this picture that I think people can see of my daughter there holding up this University of Queensland coral heart health chart at exactly this coral that the that the guardian and others were reporting as going to take 12 years to recover right that blog post has got me um, all these warnings and all these censure, censures by the fact checkers that are paid by facebook by meta they've advised that this is um uh uh, inaccurate uh, propaganda information and they've said the reason is because I was drawing conclusions about this one reef 
to the whole of the Great Barrier Reef. Now, that's what they always do. But in actual fact, if people read this blog post, they will see that I do not do that in this blog post. This blog post simply says, this article simply says, I went to John Brewer Reef on the 10th of July. I posted this on the 11th. I found the coral that the Guardian reported as um, badly bleached and it had fully recovered uh, in, 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 in three to four months. Uh, and if you scroll down, you can see some other pictures of the reef more generally. So that's all I said. And I appealed the decision and I said, I didn't draw conclusions about the whole of the Great Barrier Reef. You guys often do, but I didn't. No, now no but that now you had provided pictures of the whole reef here. It's it's fine. This is this is this is the reef crest at John Brewer, which was being reported around the world in March as the epicenter of the sixth mass coral bleaching based on aerial surveys from 150 meters in the air. Okay. So this now, is three and a half months later after the mass extinction of the Great Barrier Reef. This this is this was the epicenter of the mass extinction. Now this report that our side is getting excited about and every in particular saying, isn't it wonderful that they're saying that, you know, that the Great Barrier Reef is recovered and we've got record coral cover. Can we just go back to that picture just once more, just hold it there? That report, can you hear me? I think you've muted yourself, Diamond. I can't hear you. Yeah, I could only when I was. We, I can't unmute while I'm sharing. Oh, so sorry. I was. I was trying to go to the uh, actual report, but you want me to show uh, some pictures. I on want the just first up. What you can see there is more than. I want to just convey the concept of more than a hundred percent coral cover, and I say that because we've got corals overlapping each other. Would you agree? Yeah, that, that would be like 123% in my opinion. <laughs> okay, so we've got more than 100% coral cover and that's most of this reef is what you call reef crest. So it's all across a lot of coral, a very large area of coral across this platform that's about nine metres above the sea floor. Okay, so it's grown up over thousands of years, um, the, the, it's on top of layers and layers of dead coral. You've got this reef crest. It's just at high tide, about one and a half metres under the surface of the water, and at low tide it's pretty much sitting right on the, the, uh, at the surface of the water. So that's pretty much what a lot of this, this John Brewer reef is like. You've got 120% coral cover. Now, according to this survey, this underwater survey, this coral reef only has 21.8% coral cover, 21.8% coral cover, because they never survey the reef crest. Now, when I have arguments with Ames, they acknowledge that they never, ever survey that area of the reef that has all the corals concentrated. And that's not only the case for John Brewer Reef, that is the case for all the reefs that they survey. Their survey is only of the perimeter. Now, in the case of John Brewer and this section of reef, the perimeter is nine five to nine metres down and it's a sandy bottom and it's really patchy, scrappy coral, okay? But that is where they survey, okay? Now, that's complete madness, and I've been wanting Peter, people like uh, Peter Ridd to get upset about this and to try and force them, and I've been saying this for some years, to actually survey by habitat. So the reef perimeter is not actually a habitat. I've been wanting them to survey 
the reef crest, the back lagoon, the reef front, and well, you show can, us. You can survey right. the reef perimeter by a boat easily. Is that what they're doing? They don't want to, because you said they have the technology, drones, underwater drones, and ex, uh, small submersibles to actually do the work. But if you're providing propaganda, why would you actually want to go over the reef crest to provide, to, to prove that you're wrong? I mean, that's my question. Uh, I guess, um, you know, this is so fundamental. Survey, you know, understand the distribution of your organism before you try and work out its abundance. That's like 101 ecology. Understand the distribution of your organism before you seek to understand its abundance. And you know what? I've been quite... Um, I've been quite marginalised even within our own community for insisting on this because mostly people on our side, just whenever there's a sort of good result, they grasp it and they're thankful for it. And I'm saying, no, we need fundamentally to get these institutions to do proper science. I beg it of of them, I beg it of us, and I have been supporting this idea that we can reform them, but you know what? We can't. And it is better and that that somebody that 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 small that a small unit is funded just to do a little bit of proper science, you know, survey by habitat, rather than this idea of surveying hundreds of reefs aerially crazy perimeter surveys because even Peter Ridd, for example, will say, oh, well, it's difficult to get over a crest at low tide. So time your survey for the high tide. For goodness sake, we don't need every reef surveyed. We just need a little bit of data that makes sense, a little bit of data that is honest to the principles you learn in 101 ecology at university because what is currently being um, paraded as science people think oh well you can't survey the great barrier if it's too large you can but you have to first understand that a single reef has different habitats and coral cover at those habitats is coverage is going to vary by habitat and then you have to understand um, and design your, your survey technique accordingly. So sorry to sort of go on about the detail, but you know what? We're only going to win this war uh, or any single battle if we get into the detail, if we care about the detail. Yeah, and here's, this, I mean, this is as simple as it gets. Jan and I are both scientists, and what she's saying is so um, three-dimensionally clear to me because I'm really good at the work I do as a field geologist because I have very good three-dimensional thinking. And, all, and so reefs are basically an amazing three-dimensional creature that comes from the depths uh, as you go out towards the deep ocean basin, and it rises up on a series of uh, troughs and valleys that have been formed from the building and dying reef. And then you get to the crest, which then supports and protects the bays. And this is where everyone goes to Mexico and Australia to, to go snorkel in these protected bays and to get eaten by great white sharks. Um, but more important, more importantly, if you're, if you're actually near the reef, you'll get mauled by reef sharks. Um, but the point you is mauled by reef sharks. <laughs> no, look, um, I've been I've been a mile you... offshore in a in a secluded uh like basin, maybe like a hundred mile perimeter, which is only six feet deep with sand on the bottom, all urchins. So I couldn't step down. I had to float. And a seven foot yellow tipped reef shark came in and started swimming around me rapidly because you know how they're 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 all muscle, they're extremely erratic. And I just was, I just relaxed and he could care less about me. He was looking for something else and he just left, but it was the most frightening experience of my life. So whereabouts was that? That was in, uh, near Cozumel. So where's that? It's in, uh, near off the coast of Belize, right where Mexico meets Belize. 
Yeah. Okay. So we have white tit reef sharks and black tit reef sharks. And um, some of them can get quite large. And yeah, they don't mostly care about us. Um, they're six or I, seven I, feet, right? Because this guy was about seven foot. Yeah, they, um, I, I love to see them. And, um, and for example, a reef that I have been going out to called Pixie Reef. And if we go to our coral reef page, I can show you some of what I've been doing at Pixie Reef. As soon as the ba boat pulls up, the shark comes up to, to, to sort of greet us and, uh, and then swim down with us because I think it thinks that we're a bit amusing and a bit of company. Yeah. So where do we want to go to your website? Where are we going here? Um, so if you'd like to go to my coral reef page, so if we just go up to at the top there, along the top, you can see coral reefs. Yes. Can you see in the in the purple, yeah. Click on I've there. Clicked it. So if we go down, uh, you can see pixie. You can see some of the reefs that I've been surveying, but just go down a bit further and a bit further see that reef there just if you just go up a little bit just that's an aerial of a place called Britomart. now that was a really lovely reef but from the air it all looks, it looks bleached that's what all the reefs look like from the air so just go down to pixie 2021 so you can see pixie 2021 that i've one, clicked yeah. on it Great. So what we'll see there is people have said to me, you know, like, um, you know, it's impossible for us to sort of query what they're doing and to come up with alternative techniques. And I just went out with a couple of guys for two days and we we ran these transects, 10 metre long transects. We took a photograph every metre. We showed by habitat that you you can get a lot of coral at the reef crest but then in the back lagoon you can't you don't get much you get different corals at the reef front than what you do at the reef crest now if you just click on any one of those pictures in front of you just click on one of them it'll come up um, it should come up and, and people can see the details so there's 360 pictures that should it's not coming up double click I did click on it. It did come up. It's weird. It's not I, coming up. Oh, because it opens in a new page. So I uh, have to go to the new page. So let's go there. How about, yeah, I'll just, go, we'll go to one of the blown up uh, pictures. It just takes a second. I know. I'm, I'm kind of, it's, I'm new to this. So there it is. There's a blow up. So that is the um i think that was the third rep and the first one meter um along that um that i think this is this is the reef crest so you can get an idea from that um what what your coral cover is for that one um uh, one meter um uh so, so, so the, we've got 10 photographs uh, replicated um, three times for that day for that section of reef. So this, I've got some photographs um, and, and in fact, I've got 360 photographs that we took um, at this reef over two days. And if people want to go through them, they can see, you know, how you've got a bit of variability within habitat, a lot of variability across habitat, but you can take photographs and that gives you a, a, a record of that reef for that moment in time. Now, this reef, Pixie Reef, and I've also actually got video of this reef that I haven't done anything anything with. This reef was classified. Just come, I just go up to see what what that photograph was of. So if we just just if you just scan up um, from the that's just we just go up a bit. Uh, so that was sorry, sorry. Just I was just wanting to see which that was the. You just go that that was. 
so just up a bit higher, I just can't see the title for that, the title for the, that section. So that that was uh, Reef Crest, um, Transsex Run Across the Reef Crest, 22nd of February 2021, and I'm giving the coordinates and um, and we've got um, 30 photographs there so you can actually quantify for that reef, Pixie Reef. It's not as luxurious a reef as um, John Brewer, but you can quantify coral cover. No, but I mean, it looked like it was a hundred percent or more coral cover in those pictures. Well, no, because this should be live hard coral cover. So some of what you were seeing in that other picture was dead. But I guess the point that I'd like to make here is we can click on another one of these pictures or we can go to one of the different habitats. If you want to go down, I can show you something from um, from the reef. So we've got then we've got that's more habitat crest. And then if you go down, you can see I think I've got front next. Um, that's back lagoon. Yeah. What are we um, looking for? So we can click on and have a look at one of those. But here what we've got is an actual record of the reef for that um, that habitat for that. This is Back Lagoon. Just click on one of them and let's have a look. We'll get a different type of coral probably. Yeah, uh, yeah. Some sort of amount of coverage. But what, I'm, what I've got here is 360 photographs. Um, we've got the locations of where they were taken. They were taken along a, along transects. So here you've got a lot of um, uh, uh, you've got some um, solitary corals, and you've got a lot of rubble, a lot of broken coral, and, and you'll, you'll find a lot of this at different reefs. This reef, and if you go, it looks to like to me, uh, and I'm a novice. It looks like new coral is growing on the rubble, like forming a new reef. So um, I would say that 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 here you've you've actually got a lot of algae and a lot of dead coral, but put all together the the photographs, and at least you've got some idea of what that reef looked like for that moment in time. The aerial surveys and the underwater surveys, there are no photographs. They score this reef, they flew over it and they gave it a score of four, which is severely bleached. That was in uh, 2016. They scored it as severely bleached. There's no record of what that actually looks like. It's in the peer reviewed literature as if it, as a severely bleached reef and in actual fact if, if if people go there and start clicking there's a lot of different habitat there's so that this is the coral. pixie severely bleached reef okay. that's that's how it has been documented but 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 we've got no you know these people have got big boats they've got lots of airplanes but they've got no photographs no evidence to support their claims, be it most recently that we've got record coral cover or be it before the last federal election that we had 90% of the reefs severely bleached. Jen, do you think it's a fundamental uh, misunderstanding of what's actually happening in reef science uh, and, and what I mean by that is the Great Barrier Reef has become a repository of cyclic reef building events. And we know that there's the, the lunar standstill that exposes a great amount of these reefs to this bleaching event. We know that the standard 11-year solar cycle uh, exposes the reefs uh, to the spring and neap tides and the, and the low tides. And... And so we have a picture of this kind of cyclic reef destruction and regrowth. And we now know that it's true. It, it did get bleached. It was damaged, but it wasn't dying forever, like in some downward spiral, because it's now back. It might not be back. It might have always been back. And now they're using bad science to promote it as being back. That's the problem. You can't just, if you were, if you were on the losing team and all of a sudden they say the reef is growing now, you can't say, yay, see, it's growing because it always was. So all of a sudden now they're just using better science, which is terrible science to begin with, um, to, to align with our perspective, but none of it's good science. So it's, it's a conundrum to say the least. 
I I I think that um, that. So I guess you're saying that it's a conundrum that they've now thrown us this, you know, record coral cover based on these underwater perimeter surveys that ignore the reef crest, that we should be uh, celebrating um, those media, those few media headlines that are saying that, you know, that that we've got record coral cover. Is that is that what you're you're saying that the conundrum is that I'm a killjoy by saying but we don't actually know. No, um, no, because you and I, if we wanted to, and we were weak, we could just celebrate and say, yay, they finally said it's the truth. But they're not saying the truth because they're using bad science to promote propaganda. And the point is we need to get back to basics. And like I was saying, the reef is a three-dimensional uh, creature. It has deep water near the ocean basin. It comes up to the crest. It falls back down into the back bay. It is You could go across a transect. You don't need to survey the entire reef. You could do these cross-sectional transects in 10 areas every 57 miles and, and, and take pictures just like you're doing. And then you would have a very clear picture of outer reef, deep reef, uh, new reef, reef crest, inner bay reef. You, and also you could be taking pictures of animals and fish. So you would have so much information. But the problem is you would actually be doing science. And prior to March and the passing of the legislation, that was a major threat to the policymakers. So doing actual science is a threat to policymakers. And that's what I think we can conclude here. What say you? Uh, I would agree. It's it's uh, it all uh, they flipped the story after not March, but after the uh, 4th of well on the 4th of August 2022, because that was when the net zero legislation passed the lower house of the Australian Parliament. That's when they flipped the story, uh, focused in on a different method of uh, of surveying, uh, ditched the aerial surveys, and started talking about some underwater perimeter surveys. But you know, for me, I would like to know. And and as I think I said at the beginning, it probably is the case that with the decline in the number and intensity of cyclones, there is an increase in the amount of coral cover around the perimeters of these reefs, but it's a lot more than they're talking about, less than 30% coral cover at more than 50% of the reefs. That's like for somebody who dives, that's like, no, there's way more coral than that. How could you get such a low percentage? They never tell you in that summary, in that report that you were pulling up before that they're only surveying the perimeters or you can probably find that out if you read the detail and you understand what they're doing and you understand that a reef is three-dimensional and the crest is at the top and if you do the perimeter you're going to miss that and I guess if we really care about something we should want to know everything about it I conclude the movie Finding Parietes by saying that if we really care about something we should want to know everything about it so we need surveys that give us some idea of how reef crests across the Great Barrier Reef might or might not be changing. Because, you know, we could have some disease that's introduced and we wouldn't know its effect because these surveys are so shockingly bad. They're such nonsense surveys that if there really was something bad happening at the Great Barrier Reef, it would not be picked up. And that's a real concern to me. I'm a Queenslander. The Great Barrier Reef is right adjacent to, 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 to where I live. To, 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 it, it's, it's who I am. And yet we've got these people lying about it for this other agenda, this political agenda, this net zero agenda. You know, it hits me. It's very funny. Um. And it, it, it just hit me here based on, because I'm now at the top of the game and up to speed on everything happening on the Great Barrier Reef, as far as I'm concerned. And it seems like that this is more a case study in cherry picking 
than anything else. It has nothing to do with the science of the Great Barrier Reef, but this would be better served as a, a scientific endeavor to understand what cherry picking is in science than any other scientific conclusion. I mean, this is a very good case study for that. If we just look at the last, let's say, five years of what's been going on in science in Australia on the Great Barrier Reef and what's happened since March and now on a case study for cherry picking and someone had the moxie to do what you and I just said and say that their, uh, their methodology was beyond pathetic. I mean, we all know the scientific method and be like, oh, we looked at the edge. Oh, we looked at it from up high while we were smoking cigars. Like, uh, you didn't look at it. Why don't you send one graduate student with a scuba suit across the reef for a, uh, three weekends? Give him a $2,000 grant. He'll take pictures all week and he'll blow his mind but they don't care about the truth. They don't care about the facts. They know the agenda. And I'm pretty sure that these, and it doesn't have to be corruption at the highest level. Look, you and I are in academia. And from my end in the United States, when I was young and I was an, uh, a graduate student and I was insane, I was so excited about uh, these cutting edge catastrophic geology hypotheses. And I'm going out and I'm like, I, I just found it. I found it here. I found it there. I went to the Triassic this weekend in three quarries. I, I snuck in and I found it there. And my professors are stoked. And then I'm explaining what I want to do. And they're like, you will not, you, you're not going to get funded. There's going to be no funding. And, and I filled out all the I filled out all the grant applications again and again to do my studies. Deny, 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 deny. This is in the early '90s. This is when, if I didn't say global warming or climate change, I was saying catastrophic geology. I was saying we have a cyclic catastrophe every twenty six thousand years or so, based on the sedimentary analysis. There's some kind of a climate cycle that I was trying to unravel. And the only person that ever funded me was the Department of Environmental Protection in my own home state. They gave me $2,200 every summer. And that allowed me to camp and go into these quarries for, for two or three years. But, but that's not how we're going to get science done. $2,200 is not even going to pay for fuel out to one of these reefs. And that is the problem with science. It starts at the beginning. It is expensive uh, and it's so weather dependent getting out to these reefs and it does require a level of uh, technical competence with an underwater camera and with some scuba gear. And well, and the commitment to get the data. If you're not really wanting to get the data, you would not be committed to this endeavour. Yeah, thinking about the different habitat types at a reef and thinking that you can um, lay some tape and you can take some photographs and you can up lay, upload those photographs um, to, to to a website. And, and you know, um, sorry, I've, I've lost my, my train of thought. But well, well, this is what I just thought. Uh, were you... you you're saying I'm saying, so it is expensive to do that. By you doing it and taking the pictures because you're not funded, so to speak, you know, from the industry. Were you hoping so, an independent scientist were to, were going to look at those pictures and, and be like, oh my God, this is groundbreaking. Uh, Jen has literally confirmed that whatever they're saying is bad science and this is way better technique and there, there are other ways of doing it. So I'd like to go to, I think with Pixie Reef, I showed what you can do in terms of laying some transects and taking some photographs. I'd like to go back to John Brewer Reef and just do low altitude drone survey because that coral is mostly all along the crest and at low tide it's almost to the surface. So you could probably, I, I've sort of thought through the technique for some low altitude drone mapping of that reef it's not that it's it's not that complicated, but I think they have been relying. When I say they, the Australian Institute of Marine Science and others have been relying on the fact that people like me aren't going to be supported. Sooner or later, we're going to give up. We're never going to have enough resources. I actually think that 
well, I would love maybe we can work together to try and build a community of people who will not only fund this but will, will come out with me and, and put the drones up to do the survey work, to do the AI analysis because you know what? I've been working with people who are saying, Jen, we need to reform these institutions and we can celebrate and congratulate them when they come out with a bit of data that says there's an increase in coral cover. I'm, I'm over that. No. What we need is to show that a few of us independently funded can do a better job and that these institutions should be defunded. If you go back a couple of hundred years, philanthropy funded science, people who mm. really cared, who were curious. They funded people to, 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 to do the science. Government funding of science is actually quite a new phenomenon, and I would suggest that it's not working, certainly not when it comes to the natural environment mm. and the Great Barrier Reef. No, it's disgusting because we've proven tonight that it's policy-driven and it's a purposefully crappy science. Now, I know for a fact that there are at least three people that watch my channel that have enough money to fund. And I'm just going to throw this out there. I'm going to say for under $4 million and just a million dollars, you can go to Australia, spend a month or two with Jen, rent all the boats you need, and literally change the paradigm as far as observational science and the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, with a, maybe an extra $350,000, you can get some uh, sub, I don't even know what they're called. They're, what are they called? The underwater drones? Are they, are they submersible? Submersible submarine drones. Yeah, um, we had like three or four of them doing transverses while you're slowly moving down the reef and, and just relaxing and gathering the data and taking your time. You, you don't have to do a lot of scuba diving. That would be for fun to get a few pictures, but the drones could be taking some of the highest resolution 27. Uh, who knows the resolution in these drones? So the data could be taken. It could, it literally, if we had a small amount of money would be the most actual comprehensive Great Barrier Reef study ever conducted. And, and your name would get on the paper. You don't even have to have a PhD. You don't have to be a scientist. You're funding the operation. You're providing this. I would put anyone's name that funded me on a scientific paper because that's why the paper is available. I mean, that's basically what we're talking about, isn't it? Well, for half of the amount of money that you're talking about, you could have a boat that was operating and, and if you had these underwater drones and do some aerial as well to give you um, perspective, uh, you, you, could, you could be streaming, um, you know, 12 hours a day underwater footage. And what would be great about that would be every time they say, for example, this reef is the one that's in trouble, we would rush to that reef and we would show people exactly what was happening. And if that reef oh. was white, we would show it. And then we would also show the recovery of that reef because you know what? It's just amazing out there. The cycles, it's, it's hard to find a reef that's bleaching white at any, at any time. But, you know, at the moment. Wait, wait, wait. what you're talking about is like, um, submersibles that are in perpetuity somehow that are continuously monitoring and maybe come to a station to recharge. And they're just there like all year, 24 seven, they go out and they do a circle and they recharge and they go out and they do a circle. So at any moment they're claiming something, you're like, go over to Brewer reef number eight and let's look at what happened today. And you're like, no, it's all, it's, it's 123% cover and you're totally full of shite. And you know what? You could set this up. I mean, it would cost a bit to set up in the beginning, but once you had it going, surely it would be millions would watching. It would cost nothing. Because we would say, look, next week we're going back to John Brewer. This is the one back in the olden days where they only surveyed the perimeter, right? We're going to put the underwater submersible drone around the perimeter. 
uh, it does look a bit scrappy, the coral, you know. But, hey, we saw a couple of sharks and some nudibranchs and some, you know, speckled cod and, and some, some little clownfish. It was an interesting dive. But let's actually look now if we put the submersible over the top. Tide's gone out. We've got enough coverage. Put it over the top. Oh, it's just 121% coral cover. Um, wasn't it a big difference, coral cover and also the health and state of the corals between the crest and the perimeter? And we can all have a, a laugh about how they used to do it in the olden days before there was some accountability, some quality assurance, some independent non-government funding. Now, I would be willing to dump some seed money in that based on your expertise, because what you just brought to the picture is literally, um, I could see it all done in 4K, um, and we get some specialty drones made by manufacturers specifically for this purpose that would be doing these dives forever, or we could activate them and go take a look. So they're sitting at a hub, and we're like, we need to go to Brewer number three, and it, you know, in seven hours, we're going to be there. And there's a central hub floating with these drones on it. And this literally could be the, the change that we need. There are people listening to this idea and their mind is sparking. Now, if you're listening to this, I have the ability to create it into a successful channel. So if we, uh, let's say, own the rights to all the video, but we allow the video to all the scientists, then it, it would pay for itself and then within a year, we might be able to generate a million more dollars to, to fund the program and it would continue forever. This is the future of science. It's crowdfunding, it's crowd intellect, it's uh, citizen scientists, and it's people sick and tired of being sick and tired of being uh, lied to. Because I think a lot of people are have been picking up what you and I have been putting down for a while. There are still people that attack you. You are, you are nothing but professional and cordial. I mean, you do get angry and you get riled up, but you are, you are eons away from half of the shit I've ever said. Trust me on that one. But you and I come from different backgrounds. But the purpose, is, the purpose of us being here is the same. We want the answers. And we, we not only do we want the answers, but because we, we know right now that the wrong answers are being used for the wrong reasons that are not benefiting science or humanity. And those are, I mean, those are two big, big talking points. Agreed. Yeah. So what do we do, Jen? And give us some final words. Well, thank you for the opportunity to discuss the issues. Thank you for the opportunity to explain that there are different habitats uh, at reefs and to explain how they can say that coral cover is increasing, even though they're still talking about such a low percentage of coral cover. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to explain that they've flipped from saying that the reefs are 90% bleached, dead and dying to the, they're healthy with increase in coral cover, but that all happened on the 4th of August when they introduced, when they got through this net zero legislation. So I think they, they felt they could take their foot, if you like, their, their, their boot, if you like, off our throat because they, they've already got us in handcuffs because they're seeking to close down um, these industries on the basis that they need to, to save the, the Great Barrier Reef. And thank you for giving me the opportunity of explaining that while they're saying that they need this, that we need this legislation to save the Great Barrier Reef, in fact, the data very clearly shows that we have had a reduction in the number of, of cyclones over recent decades and an increase in the amount of coral cover, at least around our perimeters. So the irony that they're introducing this legislation to save the Great Barrier Reef from climate change when over recent decades um, climate has not been a problem at the Great Barrier Reef. We will not know if a disease has been introduced or, or was introduced that devastated reef crests because at the moment people are not surveying um, 
the reef crest. So what we need is proper, rigorous uh, surveying of the different habitats at a, different, a, a number of different types of reefs so that we actually have some idea of what is happening, how things are trending. And also in that, you would actually see the lunar cycles. You would actually see the solar cycles because a, a coral reef responds to all these things. So if there was proper surveying and ongoing surveying, people would come to understand that the Great Barrier Reef is not only incredibly diverse and still beautiful, but that it cycles. Individual reefs go through cycles. Yeah, well, your passion is infectious. And I know that there's a few millionaires out there that want to prove that the climate change paradigm is nonsense and that there are cycles that drive climate. Climate change has been happening time immemorial. I'm a geologist. I'm a climatologist. Jen is also an ecologist and she knows about climate cycles. And we know that there are things like the Pacific multi-decadal oscillation, the Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation, these 60-year cycles, the ENSO cycle. And the most important cycle is the solar cycle because the sun controls the climate. If you don't understand that when the sun sets, the temperature drops precipitously, then you have missed the point. And the point here is that if you want to become part of the movement, the great paradigm shift, in citizen science you can fund a mission. And literally, based on everything I've uh, absorbed tonight, my kundalini is lighting up. If we have a small amount of money, just a million in seed money, we can get a program up where we can start monitoring actively with such specificity. If we're, if we're making these transects back and forth across the reef through time, we will literally be able to prove the climate cycles based on photography alone, period, based on what we talked about tonight. It's that simple. This is called proxy data. We can determine how many polyps are alive and how much is being bleached and not bleached and regrowing. And, and the fact that the mainstream scientists that are the top of the field at the Great Barrier Reef claimed in plain sight to the general public. Now, the problem is 99.9% .9 of the people who read that crap won't hear what we're saying. That they said that the reef was going to die and it's going to take 12 years to recover. And when your analysis was quite concise, within three to four months, the reef recovered. Hello? That's not a new phenomenon. That wasn't an accident. It wasn't like, oh my God, a miracle happened on the Brewer's Reef. No. This is the normal variability on these types of barrier reefs. I can assure you, I went to Cancun and when that reef shark was surrounding me, it was after major cyclonic events for three years. When I went out to the reef, it was destroyed and everywhere. But what I found was like pieces of reef, like on the sand, I could pick up with a coral polyp growing on it. And I was like, wow, this is like regrowing. I said, like, oh, the reef is going to be fine. And sure enough, if you go there now, very few cyclones have hit, I think three and eight years. The reef recovery is amazing. And so with a few uh, submersible vehicles and a plan, and you are completely independent. And Jen, I'm sure if I have someone approach me, you would be willing to take upon the task of implementing this type of thing moving forward, correct? Absolutely. I, I would, it would be my, come my whole life. Yeah. So there you go. So please be, be inspired by Jen Morahasi. She's been a purveyor of the truth for years. And uh, so do you have anything planned in the future? I know we're trying to get some professional uh, editing perhaps of your new video, or do, what are you looking for, for the new video, which is, it's completely ready to be uh, put out there. Correct. So the, the videos are uh, edited and it actually homes in on John Brewer and it explains some of the problems. It's a bit more technical than my Finding Parides um, video, um, my Finding Parides movie. Um, but I actually think Finding Parides and a Coral um, Bleaching Tragedy, they go quite nicely together. What I would like to do is to be able 
to so the, the the film's done though if somebody would like the title changed or they would like um i mean it, it, i'm sure it would benefit from another edit but you know it, it's more or less ready to go i think it's ready to go i would just like some help with the uh distribution and marketing i don't want to just put it on uh, this is what i'm gonna this is what i want to throw out here right now because I know what you don't want to do. If she, if she puts it out on YouTube or these free platforms, they're not going to get paid for their efforts, first of all. And then they're going to get censored. And then they're going to get all the little screen captures and the climate change bullshit. Correct? And this might be, yeah, this might be the last film, if I can't get funding into the future, that I can ever make. Well, let's, let, let me listen to me. I have a great idea. My last trips, because I'm getting tired and old. But, you know, I put out the, the Beige Reef. Beige Reef, you know, it was a, it was a big success on, the, on, on, on YouTube. Apparently we had 100,000 hits across different platforms. Um, but, and, and there was an amount of effort in that. And then there were the other two films. I thought that our Finding Parietes was a really great little film, but it hasn't really gone anywhere because we haven't actually got support for <laughs> your own film. <laughs> so, um, is that your neighbor a or your, or your husband or who's that? So we haven't actually got support for um, we haven't we never got proper support for the distribution or marketing of finding parietes. So to a large extent, it didn't go anywhere. It's there for people to watch now. If they go to my homepage, they scroll down, they can watch it on YouTube. I think there's been not even four thousand views. Um, I think that that film was worth more than that and I think we could have done a lot better if it, we'd had proper marketing and distribution. Now, I don't know exactly what that looks like because that's not my area of expertise and it never will be. I know about how to survey a reef crest, okay? I know how to... To, 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 to do underwater stuff. I know how to do biology stuff. There are people who know about the distribution and marketing of films, but I know to, to engage them, I, I need an amount of money. And then we can work out how to maybe package finding parietes that people can already watch with a coral bleaching tragedy, which is all done and ready to go, so we can get it out on DVD so that we can get people to maybe if they pay for it, they value it a bit more. Maybe then they can, you know, have some film nights. Maybe we can go on a bit of a tour with these two films because I know when um, when I uh, organised the little original showing of Finding Parietes, the Australian Institute of Marine Science got all upset because I was showing it in a local theatre, in a local cinema, and I had the cinema packed out. So I think you get more attention and, you know, if you do the marketing and distribution professionally, but I don't know how to do that. I need help. Well, I'm going to throw out a little bit of a hook, line, and sinker here, and I want to give you some help. Thank I you. Think, I think that finding parietes and I watched it, it's almost a year old. Maybe it's even older was so mm. significant a movie that I'm uh, taken aback at the fact that you've had so little uh, traction on it. And the title of the next uh, documentary is so significant that what we should do is crowdfund it. And that with you, your uh, pull in Australia and my pull in uh, America, we could easily raise a hundred thousand to a million dollars in one to th to two months. And we and you keep that uh, pot, you keep that documentary on the back burner. And what we're doing is we're going to be selling DVDs of it. We're and there'll be a cheaper option where they can get a video file of it. And. And, and we'll do other perks and we'll even have like a stretch goal where you could donate a million dollars to the crowdfunding site to, to fund uh, the actual the climate change. Because I don't need to be paid for the movie that I've done. But no, no, I we're just going to sell the movie you've done so that a million people buy it and, and not only 4,000 people watch it. Then we can do the citizen science check stuff. 
So no, no, if we reach the goal, the money will pay for the citizen. Like if we make three hundred, eight hundred thousand dollars selling the movie, Parides and the bleaching uh documentary, then, then that, that will fund the, the next phase. That's the correct. actual science. My fear is that if this movie just gets put out there, it's probably it, it's it's perhaps the end because I just can't going, keep going on the current model. No, Jen, it's too important. This is because they put out the fact that the Great Barrier Reef recovered and that it's not good science and that what we want to do is good science. And when we explain it to the public in a crowdfunding environment, they will believe us. Trust me, this is the right time. And we will literally fund you for the rest of your life and the wonderful things you want to do. And I think you and I should talk at length uh, when we get done this podcast to continue this narrative. What are your thoughts? Thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you so much for having me on your show today. And um, yeah, we covered a lot more than, uh, than I thought we would. And I'm grateful for that opportunity. Thank you so much, Diamond. Yeah, let's get this. Uh, let's do it on Kickstarter because that's the largest platform. I have some connections there. I've had some really successful uh, Kickstarters that I've promoted. Uh, a friend of mine has been able to publish every single book he's wanted for the last three years. His last Kickstarter was so successful. He's now rocking it off into the stratosphere. So you and I, with this uh, idea and this premise and with your persona in Australia, I think the sky's the limit. And I'm going to be, I, I'm a very good estimate of success. I'm going to say that if we do this correctly and we release this documentary as a crowdfunded documentary where you can get access to the, the digital format or the hard copy, and then you can actually try to fund the citizen science efforts moving forward, we're looking at a half a million to $3 million in just a few months. I mean, that's a low estimate. So, so I, I hope that brings a smile to your face. Jennifer, it's always a pleasure to have you on the show. And let's uh, talk a little bit when we end the show about reef health and the future of the Great Barrier Reef. Thank you. Be safe. We love you.